Okay, um, good day. Mi hele nyefe atu, akwaba, karibu, and salamat datang to the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health in Kuala Lumpur and day two of the Gender and Health Hub Annual Forum. In partnership with my wonderful colleagues from the School of Public Health at the University of Western Cape and the AU Commission at the African Union Commission on COVID-19, I'm delighted that you have joined us today. My name is Pascal Alate, and I'm the director at the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, UNUIIGH. The COVID-19 pandemic has been truly, truly awful. And if ever we needed evidence on the extent of globalization, this is it. Arguably, even more so than the world wars. Everyone has been touched either directly or to low degrees of separation by the disease or the measures introduced to prevent or mitigate infection, morbidity and mortality. Progress towards gender equality has been severely compromised directly and indirectly. And I'll take a couple of seconds here to remind us that we still very much need the 16 days of activism campaign to end the gender-based violence. Inequities are reinforced by conservative and neo-colonial global politics. And the pandemic in some cases has brought out the best in us and in others has laid bare the worst in us. It has been highlighted by the hypocrisy of motherhood statements about global solidarity. And on the other hand, the utter selfishness and nationalism um, on the other. So we can either complain and make ourselves victims or we can step up and seize the opportunities offered by the catalytic effect of this disaster. And this is why I am so excited about this partnership between UNUIIGH, University of Western Cape and the African Union Commission on COVID-19. There are multiple initiatives, institutions, actors and leaders across the region working to tackle gender inequalities in health in the public health response to COVID-19. And for those who attended the day one session yesterday, the clear message demonstrated the strength of collective action. So today's forum presents an initiative, the aim of which is to foster synergies and relationships with actors and leaders across the region and provide a space to amplify a diversity of voices and generate a greater evidence-based impact. More importantly, this initiative aims to help us to learn from each other and to build on transferable best practice examples. To ensure authenticity, we need to hear from you. As you'll hear, this work is very much at, at the initial stages and, and alongside our collaborators, the School of Public Health and the AU Commission on COVID-19, the plan is to kickstart in earnest in 2022 hopefully a better year than the last two. So get your fingers ready to engage through the Q&A function of this virtual meeting room. Make some noise on social media and let us know what is happening, what is happening and how we can work better together towards gender equality and health, particularly in response to building back better from the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is what I need you to do. Questions from the panelists need to go Questions for the panelists need to go in the Q&A section. Please note that for us, the questions would not be anonymized, but it's just for our purposes. So please don't let that deter you from putting questions in. It doesn't matter if you're, you're identified. Share your thoughts and comments and introduce yourself through the chat function. Um, if you have registered, you have access to all four sessions and the 30 speakers over the three days of the UNU Gender and Health Hub Annual Forum. And remember to explore the Philo platform for the session agenda, speaker bios, networking space, and knowledge products from UNUIIGH and our partners. So enough from me. It's my pleasure now to hand you over to Professor Asher George. South African Research Chair in Health Systems, Complexity and Social Change at the University of Western Cape. For most of you, Asha needs no introduction, but we know that women are notoriously bad at establishing our credentials. So I'm going to embarrass her. Asha is also a Principal Visiting Fellow at the, at, with us at the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health and has played an important role in the Gender and Health Hub's People-Centered Research Initiatives 
and regional partnerships in Africa. Asha has made significant contributions to global health through her work on health systems to advance health and social justice in low and middle income countries. With a gender and rights lens, she focuses on the frontline interface and governance of services taking into consideration community engagement and health worker perspectives. She is a pioneer, a disruptor um, in pushing, forwards the, pushing forward the boundaries of orthodox ways of knowing. And Asha defines Primus into Paris. Asha, the virtual floor is yours. You're muted. Yes, thank you so much, Pascal, for that generous introduction. And I'm, I'm so excited. I'm just waiting to see the slide is up. Um, can Great, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Pascal, for that generous introduction. I'm so excited to be part of this initial conversation. Um, it's an exploratory session. And we wanted to start in the most con consultative way. We're very excited for the colleagues who have joined us for the panel today. And for all of you who have signed in, we look forward to your questions, comments, and contributions. So I just have a few brief slides to set the scene. And then I'll be handed over, uh, handing over to Shakira and our panelists to start the conversation. So a few background comments on why we are um, having this conversation and how, why we're so excited to bring uh, all of you together for this and for much more further down the line. Firstly, it's looking at, as Pascal said, in our region in, in Africa, um, COVID-19 has hit us particularly hard. Um, particularly if we look at the SDG goals for health and gender equality. And it's not just COVID-19. It's also we are at the brunt of climate change and, you know, the colonial history that has marked the terms of trade um, in, from colonial times to today's times and the types of political status quo that mark our region. These are also contested by important um, social movements and various initiatives that have really um, stepped up to respond to COVID-19 and to gender and health more broadly. So we thought we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to galvanize change across the region. And so we thought we'd uh, work together to really look at what, what are the key issues we should be focusing on sharing knowledge, um, sharing experiences of what is what's happening on the continent, and to do that to support policy translation. Uh, to First, it's good to come together to talk and share, but then to support action. That's what we care about. So in the next slide, I think we have um, some background on why it's so important to come together. And a number of our panelists um, know this and the participants in the room, but it's worth just um, taking stock. So we know the pandemic has had huge consequences for gender-based violence. For instance, in Nigeria alone, uh, domestic violence in, uh, increased by 56% during the first two weeks of the pandemic. Um, there have been massive implications for adolescents and adolescent girls in particular. Um, we saw higher um, dropout rates for girls and the consequences they bore in terms of child marriage and unintended pregnancy. For instance, here's some data from Malawi that we had 5,000 cases of teenage pregnancies in the South um, following the pandemic and as well as in Uganda in terms of teenage pregnancies um, increasing massively. Um, it also has had consequences for programming. Um, programs that were put in place and were succeeding in changing these trends were also put to a halt due to COVID-19. And therefore it's been estimated that 2 million preventable FGM cases could occur because programming that we had in place was pulled to a halt because of the pandemic. 
So looking at all this, in the next slide, you'll see we wanted to start the conversation about how do we look at responses. And here is a slide looking already on how um, several countries responded to, for instance, gender-based violence. Um, we had a lot of responses looking to strengthen services for women survivors. Uh, so, for instance, in Mozambique, and we have Franz Dr. Francelina Romao in the panel, um, they started a helpline immediately um, to support um, women and girls. There were awareness campaigns. So in Niger, there was an awareness campaign kicked off through the radio. Um, and there was also a, a, a trigger to improve data collection. What's striking and what's not on the slide is that so few countries, despite the importance of violence against women, included violence against women as an essential service in the COVID-19 response. Um, in the mapping that UNDP did, only Zimbabwe and South Africa flagged services for against violence against women as an essential service. And yet when it came to funding, actually only Zimbabwe followed up with that with actually providing additional funding. Um, a lot of the programs focused on responding to survivors, but even before COVID, only 7% of women um, reached out, survivors reached out for formal help. And I imagine that was even less uh, with the implications of COVID-19. And the reason where we'd like to come together and create this platform is there are missed op opportunities. COVID-19, we had a lot of social protection measures. Um, and one of the proven uh, best practices to prevent gender-based violence are cash transfer programs because it reduces the household stress. And that was a missed opportunity in terms of bringing together the cash transfer programs, the social protection measures that were having, happening under COVID-19 with this huge rise in gender-based violence. So we have a lot to learn and share to improve our policy responses. And that's why we're coming together. If we go to the next slide, please. So briefly, we wanted to come together um, with, and we're delighted to have, it's the School of Public Health at the University of the Western Cape, but with UNU, but with also all of you as part of this conversation. And I'm just going to flag a few examples of existing work uh, on which this builds. In the next slide, we have the What Works in Gender and Health in the UN. I'm trying to speak slowly, even though I am so, there's so much to share <laughs> in the limited time. Um, so I'm just racing along so that we have time for the panelists. Um, this, was a, this was released yesterday for all of you who joined us yesterday. It's a very exciting study. And this is, we'd like to do more of this. It was work that really looked at case studies of how do we, how did the UN uh, succeed in gender mainstreaming? What were the examples? And it was done with UN partners on what works for whom, why, and where. And these are the types of best practices that we think would be valuable to emphasize. And just to flag the ones that were highlighted were around gender norms, menstrual health and hygiene by UNICEF, the work on FGM and gender norms, and there are some good practices that we could strengthen and share around HIV and gender. This will also build, many of you were involved. Um, we are tomorrow um, launching the results of a process of working collaboratively on setting the research agenda for COVID and gender 19. We were really excited to host uh, a convening in June with, for West and Central Africa. Um, because we had so many people from Eastern and Southern Africa already part of the su survey um, and part of the initiative. Um, you'll be hearing results on these five themes, and we had lots of engagement with individuals, as you see the slide looking at from Makareri Grace Maria Cantaro um, flagging what she thought was important in terms of the gender and COVID-19 research agenda. 
looking at gender-based violence and participatory research to help women and children in her country. Next slide. So um, we and the one after, I just wanted to flag two examples of other initiatives. And we have colleagues here from the African Union. Um, there is a, a commission, the AU Commission on COVID-19 led by Professor Sanait Trivseha. Um, it is actually doing very exciting work and we'll be hearing from our partners um, looking at and following up specifically with state part parties looking at how they have honored uh, their obligations based on CEDA and the COVID-19 guidance note that they developed. And the idea is to launch a framework and use the evidence for action. Next slide. And the key things they're going to track are the incidents of violence against women, what have been the responses to violence against women, uh, what do we know about vaccination and gender, and what has been the impact on sexual and reproductive health services? Next slide. At the same time, um, we there's other exciting initiatives, and I just wanted to flag this in 2022. There are a series of implementation research projects looking at gender transformative approaches with colleagues across East, West, and Southern Africa, um, working to look at uh, documenting and um, undertaking studies around adolescent and sexual reproductive health, focusing on gender transformative interventions. So we have a lot to learn as these initiatives kick off and to strengthen that platform for sharing. So if we go to the next slide, that lays out a few examples of things that are happening, both the context, um, what has happened under COVID-19, and a few initiatives that are stepping up to respond. But I'm sure there's a lot more to discuss and we'd love to hear from everyone else from the panel on what should we do next? What are key things happening in the region um, that we should pay attention to? And how do we work with all of you? What are the key priorities and gaps? And what should we do differently to have impact and to work together um, on this um, to advance gender and health in the region, particularly given COVID-19. So with that, I'm going to introduce our moderator, uh, Dr. Shakira Chun Chunara is with us. We're delighted she could join us. Uh, many of you may know her already. Uh, she works for WHO as a technical specialist, but she's also a very passionate youth activist and change maker, and also is, serves on the Lancet Commission for um, adolescent health and well-being. Delighted to have you with us, um, Shakira. Over to you. Thank you. So very good morning, everyone. Well, at least that's morning in my time zone, Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm not sure where you're based. We're going to jump right into action uh, today because essentially we've got a lot to get through, but I think it's an important starting point uh, for action on this continent in terms of Three topics, one, gender inequality, two, COVID-19, and healthcare, and how they all come together. I'm here this morning, or at least today, with a powerhouse of panelists. And I don't want to call it, or I don't want to call our speakers panelists, because ideally today it's a collective session, as Professor Asher George said. We want to sit down together with you as the audience. We want you to interact via the chat box. Really, let's light the chat box on fire. Um, no pun intended, of course. And we're going to also go through what are the different perspectives that these critical stakeholders have in terms of how do we set up a platform, a network, or possibly even an action-oriented mechanism um, for the issues that we see in our continent and exacerbated by gender inequality. We're joined today by Dr. Francelina uh, Romeo, who's from the Embassy and Permanent Mission of Mozambique, also based in Geneva, Professor Agnes uh, Bianguaho, and I do apologize for pronunciations, University of the Global Health, Dr. Khalifa Bello, um, if my French translation is correct, a researcher based at uh, the Center of Reproduction and Demography, 
Dr. Luazi Manzi, the African Union Commission Africa's COVID-19 response strategy, and Dr. Elif Senetembwe uh, from the World Health Organization, a fellow colleague. So jumping right into it with again our powerhouses of panelists, a quick reminder though, I, I found it quite difficult to tweet and try and facilitate at the same time. Um, if you're attending today's session, it's part of an annual forum, hashtag GHH Forum 2021. We'll post that in the chat box. Tag us, share your thoughts in this chat box online. We encourage you. If you require translation function, the interpretation button is out at the bottom and otherwise all housekeeping and protocol observed. In the next 15 minutes, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat to, to understand what each of these powerful women and women who grapple with the realities of what other women and other genders face on this continent um, are envisioning for a network and platform for action. It's really a brainstorming action and uh, a session. And Professor Agnes uh, Beneg uh, Beneguajo, or Professor Agnes, if I may, let's kick off with you. You have exactly 2.5 minutes to, to take us through your thoughts. What does a network look like? What are the priorities? Oh, an, a network look like quick to react to the needs. So that means we need to do our homework first. And the best way to do that is to use implementation science study the context and the strategy that has been successful. We have so many group strategies across the world, in Latin America, in all, all, all over the world. Collect them, know the context, use the, the right strategies according to the context and make it work. And also we have enough women in power and go for no, uh, no mercy for, for violence against women, but be proactive. Don't wait the violence. We know that it exists. Stop thinking yes or no. Let's go be proactive and act accordingly. Proactivity. I don't know if I still have half a minute. You have lots of time. If you want to continue, so, you can. Yes, so that means we have good example and we can discuss them here in East Africa, in South Africa, in West Africa, in Latin America, in India. But the system are strong and we will be strong only if we do national connection inside all the institution, regional connection, continental connection, and we go globally in an alliance and work all together. Activism and always pay fruits. We need to be more strong, more present, and really proactively. So that means educate women. Like in my university, we have 70% of our enrollment of women in medical education as a basic, because we know we need more, more women um, educated and powerful, in powerful area and train them to to be advocate so that they can talk for the others. Thank you. Professor Agnes, on point, you've thrown the issues at us, really quick to react, be proactive. Um, you know, we will come back to you in a second. Let's shift to your colleague and thanks for setting this tone for the discussion. Essentially, yes, this is step one, but the issues we're dealing with are urgent. And so an urgent network is needed. Uh, Dr. Olive, turning to you, if I may, what are the priorities we need to focus on within a joint network? Uh, we, within a joint network, we will have to be very, very um, accommodative because the issues that have affected are actually uh, multi-sectoral and it is going to require a very good team at the national level to be working together right from the government ministries and their service provision up to the academia and uh, well, national NGOs to put issues together, especially right now for Uganda, we are really affected by the school closures disproportionately affecting the girl child but also the boy child, by the way, has been affected. For us, while girls have gotten pregnant, the boys, some of them have gotten into work and they're not willing to go back. So already there, we must deal with the schools 
opening both boys and girls going back to school. But the lockdowns have also made it impossible for the men to have opportunities for gainful employment. This has reduced completely their at home, staying at home, and this has increased interpersonal violence, domestic violence, violence against children. These are real issues because men are at home. Men should not be at home. Their jobs have disappeared for many, but also for many, there is no more employment really, or they are underemployed. We are also looking at the disappearance of women and girls' voices in the whole community discussion of issues affecting them. So we want to ensure that NGOs, universities, government are really uh, looking at how to bring back the conversation with girls, with women, women groups at all levels on the issues affecting them most during this HIV pandemic and its effects. We must invest in the RMNCAH mental health issues that are coming up strongly. And yet we are drawing away health workers from the standard RMNCAH services to COVID-19 related uh, services. Of course that is lifting, but it is lifting with some health workers negatively affected mentally, psychosocially, and we need to be addressing the mental health and psychosocial health of health workers within the RMNCH service delivery points. But we are also seeing for us in Uganda that hardly a programs talking about the male involvement issue, even within the RMNCH, yet we are aware that most of the issues we really need to be addressing relate to men and how they are supporting or not supporting, how they are nurturing or not nurturing. And there's so many things they need to be supportive within a home environment that is already compromised because of the socioeconomic environment that is surrounding them. For us, some of the services have really reduced, especially GBV, adolescent health, uh, while they were coming up uh, in the time before COVID, during COVID, we see little being discussed around um, GBV services, adolescent health services, or even resources going to these specific areas of work. And yet, these are the areas which have really surfaced within this period. I think my time is over. Thank you very much. That is what I think we should be concentrating on, teasing out these issues as they are appearing in the country and using data as much as possible to support these seemingly new but not so new areas of work, which are being worsened, as you know, by our social cultural uh, beliefs and practices. So that must also come on board. Thank you very much. Okay, Adam, sorry for cutting you off. I can't see you, so that's when I jumped in. But you've set the scene accidentally. And the one issue that you've, you've really brought to the fore essentially is employment and close to 60% of young people across this continent remain unemployed. During this pandemic, a less spoken about issue is that young people are the very first to enter the, the workforce and the first to be retrenched. They're in un, or unstable employment, for example, and they're the first to go. And I've seen that across not just young boys, but young women as well across the continent who during this pandemic have lost their jobs. We'll, we'll shift on to Dr. Luwazi Manzi, and I think a lot have, has been said. If you don't mind, I'll put you on the spot a little bit and ask you, how do you see a mechanism slash platform, I'm not sure what we're calling it at this stage, really accelerating Agenda 2063, the Maputo Protocol of Action, for example, and then of course, a mechanism such as the COVID-19 response. In addition, the floor is yours to, to voice what you, you would like to bring to the fore. No, thank you so much for the question. I'll answer that question in just 30 seconds. I wanted to um, add a little bit to the statistics just to demonstrate uh, how much our work is cut out for us. Uh, so a couple of things that have recently come out in the past week from Statistics South Africa in this country, 300, uh, sorry, 30,000, 33,000 teenage pregnancies. Uh, in the period of 2021. 
660 pregnancies aged 10 and below. We have got, here's one target that we must have, eliminate childhood pregnancies. I don't see why we can't have that target. And we must have that target, we must eliminate. We cannot have a situation where, I've, I've, I've uh, delivered a, a child, um, you know, that, that was 10 years old, uh, a mother, a 10 year old mother. It's a very traumatizing experience. Um, and uh, just on the fourth um, of, of this month, um, we have been told that the life expectancy of women has been disproportionately reduced by a year, as opposed to men who are disproportionately reduced by a couple of months. So we really do have our work cut out for us. Now, coming together is a very good thing and mobilizing political will is an excellent thing. We've just had the men's conference where the Circle of Champions was launched and um, this is all very well. But to come to your question, the danger that we run into is that our collaborative efforts are going to be, are going to stay in the political and academic space. And this has always been a problem that um, I have had personally, just as a woman who, who, who likes to be involved in activism. And this is a problem that even our leaders have actually raised. You know, President Ramaphosa, when he launched the Women's Economic Forum, said that we have to massify everything that we do. And he was not happy about the numbers that he was announcing of the things that were being done on the ground. He said, we must massify. So I believe that at the, at the space that we fall in, you know, we fall in just, it's just somewhere in between the political world, which has been mobilized, we have it now, um, and then in the academic space and the actual ground work that must actually happen. And I am hoping that in our collective efforts, we really ensure that we, we collect in a manner that uh, ensures that there is vertical integration and that there is concentration on ground implementation. I think all of our colleagues have now made this point that we need to implement on the ground. We need to just implement projects. We rather make mistakes along the way and the academic world um, should potentially concentrate on monitoring and evaluation on programs that are being implemented. This is what we're trying to do uh, in the work that we're doing as a commission. We are, we are monitoring and evaluating what has been implemented in, during uh, the surge periods of 2021, what has worked, what has not worked, so that we can go back to the policymakers and say, you know, these are the tweaks and the changes that we need to make. And we must connect uh, with uh, the ground forces, the social partners that are actually doing the work on the ground. Uh, just to end off, you know, if you listen to women, ordinary women, when they talk on, on uh, social media, when they talk uh, to us, you know, directly as leaders, they are saying they are tired of hearing of us talking amongst each other. They're tired of hearing that billions and billions of dollars have been mobilized for this and that and the next thing. They don't see, uh, you know, all of that political will and all of that money manifesting on the ground. So we really, really need to concentrate as a collective on working together, overcoming all of the geopolitical barriers and getting the work done, helping those people who are doing the work on the ground to massify everything that they're doing as has our, our president who is the champion on COVID-19 has very, very clearly asked of us to do. Thank you very much. I'll stop there for now. There we have it for those listening in. Dr. Luanzi Manzi is really bringing to the fore the issue of teenage pregnancy. We see the rising statistics and we're seeing it being even ever increasing rising during COVID-19. Before you go, Dr. Luazi, a quick question back to you. What do you think are some of the entry points for teenage pregnancy that we need to prioritize within a network like this? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by entry points, but let me, let me try to attempt. I, I did read a very interesting article, I wish I could remember the author, that, that did speak about teenage pregnancies. And they spoke about um, a switch in mentality in how we actually handle sexuality amongst uh, your teenagers and therefore the issue of teenage pregnancies. We tend to, um, our programs um, and our interventions tend to focus on the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas we really should be focusing more on um, an exchange of dialogue and ideas between um, you know, uh, those of us who are helping to intervene and the actual teenagers themselves to understand the actual context 
that they find themselves in. And then when a teenage, teenage mom does find themselves um, you know, being pregnant, that they actually should be supported through the pregnancy. So we know that there have been policies, for example, in schools where now you, you know, you, you, you're actually not allowed to uh, uh, um, suspend or dismiss a child that's pregnant. The, the child must continue with their pregnancy, support services, not only in the hospitals, communities, uh, youth-friendly centers, et cetera, et cetera. I think we really need to do more work in that regard. But I also really believe that we, I think, I think for me, and this is a much broader answer to what you're asking, but I think it's going to be really critical when it comes to uh, issues that are affecting young, young te teenagers or the right young women. I think that the, the reason why we're seeing, despite a lot of interventions, violence persisting against women and girls, um, is because we really still need to have very honest and very frank conversations and interventions on the cycle of violence itself, men being violent with men, women being violent with men. I'm not talking about physical violence, I'm talking about other kinds of violence, you know, any kind of violence where you use the pre-constructs, the predetermined constructs of gender roles to justify or motivate that violence against another person. That I think for me is the root cause of the cycle of violence and, and one of the colleagues did actually mention this before. And I think that this is a conversation that we, we really, and an intervention that we really need to make at that level. Um, you know, uh, before we, we hope that, you know, social protection, you know, throwing money at things, fixing the healthcare system and all, and all of that will actually fix the issue of, of gender-based violence. Thank you, well, Manzi. Thank you. Um, essentially, you know, you've also touched on entry points such as data, which is hugely important. One thing that I specifically find interesting is the the Lancet's uh, sort of theory on um, adolescents now, their health, and their future, uh, their future populations, or or you know, future populations which come as well. And the one thing which is overlooked when it comes to teenage pregnancy is what's the, the socioeconomic um, implications for the little ones, the ones which are born. Um, what's the implications right now due to the global gag rules? So many CSOs have, have really stopped abortion services, for example. And this has also contributed to the increase in teenage pregnancy. So it's a really complex issue that we need to think through. As we're about to go ahead, I see close to 54 participants in total um, on this, this very discussion. And I see uh, colleagues such as Eileen Young, um, Anne Cortez, uh, Tanya Jacobs, quite a few. And this session, again, to reiterate, is to try and get collective feedback. It's step one. We've got an exciting lineup of speakers to take us through what are the priorities um, how would a network operate? What does a network look like? What do we need to get a network started? Again, a recap, gender inequality, COVID-19 and Africa. So I would really encourage you to post your thoughts in the chat box. It really is an unfiltered open space. We want to hear from you uh, within the next few minutes and beyond that as well. As we move ahead, we also have the question and answers uh, segment of the, the call where you can post your question to any speaker or even um, put it out in general. So we're going to move on to Dr. Kapila, and I hope I'm saying that right, Dr. Kapila. Dr. Kapila, let me ask you a question to, to get our juices flowing. In five years time, imagine we're five years from now, and you look back, what what would this network look like? Um, what would it have achieved? What are your dreams? What do you envision? What do you really want to see from a collective coming together, starting off with UNUIGI, um, School of Public Health, the African Union Commission and its organs, um, but other networks, civil society, policymakers, five years from now, this thing or this this activity that we're starting today, what should it look like? Merci beaucoup. Je vais y aller en français. Et mer merci de me permettre de rêver un peu. Et je, je pense que dans cinq ans, je verrai comme grande euh, réalisation de ce, euh, ce réseau un vrai partenariat, 
un vrai partenariat entre différents pays. Donc, pouvoir créer des ponts entre les différents pays, créer des ponts entre le monde, par exemple, anglophone et le monde francophone, pouvoir se parler. Et surtout, euh, pouvoir avoir un vrai partenariat entre les personnes qui sont au niveau des politiques, au niveau de la recherche, et ceux qui sont vraiment sur le terrain. Donc, on est prêt à en parler. Euh, ce qu'on reproche souvent aux partenariats existants, surtout sur le plan mondial, c'est vraiment qu'ils sont parfois, à un moment donné, ils se retrouvent déconnectés de, euh, du terrain, ils se retrouvent un peu déconnectés des réalités du Et je pense que ce partenariat peut nous permettre de vraiment avoir des... Euh, euh, nous permettre de pouvoir discuter avec ceux qui sont sur le terrain pouvoir prendre en compte les besoins réels des populations et ne pas juste rester peut-être superficiel et ne pas rester sur des slogans ou sur des approches qui vont nous juste peut-être même renforcer encore les inégalités qui existent. Et ce que je voudrais ajouter aussi, je, euh, il y a un des participants qui a parlé de l'éducation. Je pense que l'un des points que nous pouvons aussi, sur lequel nous pouvons vraiment travailler. Parce que lorsqu'on parle aussi d'inégalité de genre, lorsqu'on parle de problèmes d'accès, l'éducation est vraiment un point important où nous pouvons, sur lequel nous pouvons travailler. C'est vrai, nous pouvons actuellement travailler sur les inégalités de genre, mais dans quelques années, les hommes et les femmes de deux mais sont actuellement des filles et des garçons. Et c'est très important de pouvoir éduquer ces filles et ces garçons-là pour qu'ils puissent vraiment euh, intégrer euh, l'égalité des gens, qu'ils puissent vraiment se préparer à un monde où tout un chacun peut s'exprimer librement et vivre pleinement sa vie sans être entravé par les normes euh, liées aux gens. Donc, euh, voilà un peu ce que je peux partager là. Professor Selina, excellent to hear from you and also sharing your insights around in five years' time what this would look like. We appreciate it. Before I let you go, another question, um, and I've seen a couple of, of comments in the chat box. Keep them coming. We absolutely want to hear from you um, this morning, evening, whatever time, uh, time zone you're in. Uh, Dr. Francelina, um, Dr. Francelina, Dr. Capilla, I do apologize, this virtual facilitation is much more different to, to doing it in person and keeping all my post-its all over. Uh, Dr. Kapila, before you go, let us know your thoughts. What would make a network like this work? What's the ingredients for success? Uh, déjà, il faut que nous apprenions uh, du passé. Euh, donc, le professeur Agnès a parlé de proactivité. Et ce que nous voyons souvent dans les réseaux existants, c'est que, passé l'excitation du début, on tombe rapidement dans la routine et euh, rapidement dans la fossilisation. Donc, l'un des ingrédients clés pour que tel partenariat marche pourrait être d'avoir euh, une facilitation dynamique, déjà reconnaître l'importance d'avoir la facilitation dans ce genre de réseau et pouvoir avoir une facilitation dynamique qui est réellement inclusive et qui permet en fait à plusieurs institutions de pouvoir travailler ensemble pour pouvoir euh, être euh, vraiment apporter leur pierre à l'édifice. Euh, euh, deuxième ingrédient, euh, on pourrait, euh, un, un deuxième ingrédient qu'on pourrait apporter au niveau de ce euh, panel, c'est de pouvoir travailler, donc combiner en fait des activités que nous faisons sur le plan global avec des activités beaucoup plus sur le terrain. Donc, en général, c'est prouvé que lorsqu'on combine les deux types d'approches, ça permet de vraiment avoir des idées plus fraîches 
d'avoir d'autres sons de cloche parce qu'un autre piège dans lequel ce type de partenariat peut nous amener, c'est de pouvoir se focaliser en fait sur les idées d'un petit groupe de personnes qui en général sont peut-être des élites ou des experts dans le domaine et très souvent on n'a pas forcément un renouvellement de, de, de ces idées. Donc pouvoir travailler avec des gens sur le terrain, donc combiner des activités aussi bien sur le plan régional, global que des activités de terrain, ça pourrait être un ingrédient pour la réussite d'un tel réseau. Merci. Merci, uh, Dr. Ke uh, Kefila. And I think you've pointed to two issues, looking at past, um, past experiences, and then working on the ground level. And we know on this continent, that's absolutely critical. Now for the real Dr. Pran Selina Romeo, uh, who's part of the, um, uh, who's a health counselor, also part of the embassy of Mozambique, I believe. Dr. Pran Selina, We've just heard from your colleagues. Any quick reflections on what's been said? You're muted. Dr. Francelina, apologies. You're just on mute. Can you try again, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm trying not to, to repeat. Oh, I'm so sorry. Said. For some reason, we still can't hear you, um, but I think I might know what the problem is. On your little microphone where your mute button is, can you click the little arrow beside it? And if you click that little arrow where it says select a microphone, please yeah, select yeah, external I... microphone or headset, Kat. it might say. Cat, everyone can hear how you're in interpretation, I think. Hello? No, Can not you hear yet. Me? Can you try and select a different audio or maybe unplug your headset and plug it back in? Um, apologies, everyone. We'll just take just two seconds here to ensure that we can hear um, Dr. Francelina. Hello? Uh, many of us are able to hear Dr. Francelina. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Apologies. I can't hear Dr. Francelina. Very sorry. Um, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I was saying that uh, uh, there are a few points that I want to make. I don't want to repeat what already was said. F my first point is that gender equality in health can only work or prevail if other dimensions, such as the economic and other social areas are also tackled because these this, this inequalities have also um, economic and other social uh, uh, problems attached. If we look at the, what I call emergency situation with all these teen pregnancies, this um, increase of uh, uh, genital mutilation, rape of minors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We are living in an emergency. And I would like to see that the collaboration that is going to uh, happen is going to reflect that something is going to be done because we cannot go on like this with these younger girls and these women. I believe that the strengthening of services for girls and women, raising awareness, et cetera, et cetera, is, is very important, but we need to have stronger community involvement to make sure that everything that we do are going to maintain and the community is going to um, build on that. The other point is that I don't think we have done doing enough on dealing with the root causes of gender uh, inequality. When I see many women organizations or women discussing women or gender issues, I keep asking myself, are we the root cause? Certainly women are part of the equation so they are part of the solution, but I think that we could do better. 
in terms of men involvement so that we can grow together and we can in five years or 10 years or when the next pandemic arrives, we are going to be in a better footing that we were in 2020 when the COVID came. In relation to regional collaboration, we have many good practice. And I myself remember when I worked for the South African, uh, for, not for, but with the South, Southern African Development Community where uh, uh, gender and health was a very strong part of the activities that were developed. So I would recommend we could revisit some of this experience and see if we can build on, on the new collaborative uh, platform we are thinking of. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Franzelina Romeo. Again, on Twitter, we hashtag GHH Forum 2021. You've just heard from Dr. Franzeline Romeo. We're going to do a quick round, a lightning round as we end off. We do see one question in the box and panelists are, are welcome to answer the question live. Um, it's, it's actually quite an enthusiastic question already looking for possible opportunity within the network. Um, a couple of uh, stakeholder, a couple of uh, attendees have highlighted the issue of comprehensive sexuality education that is receiving massive backlash on the continent um, and a key issue. I'm going to start one more time with you, Professor Agnes, uh, because you really gave us an energetic start off this morning. One, how will this network be different to what's already out there? And two, do you have a possible name for the network? <laughs> no, I don't have a name, but this is not the most difficult thing. Huh? With my friend Lousy, we are naming so many things uh, <laughs> for the continent. Uh, but uh, if I want you, I will do a contest among young adolescent girls and ask them how they see it, how they want to name it for this to talk to them. And we, the old grandma, we will follow. Um, the, the uh, your other question was uh, how could you say it again? Why will this network stand out? What gap does it fill? What makes it different to everything so, that's out there at the moment? We have learned that life with COVID is no longer the same, and we should take lessons for everything we missed before COVID. And we have done great things with COVID. Can I give you an example? Every day on Twitter, I have the exact number of people and in each resist district, not the name, who are dying with COVID. Why do, can I not have the name of people uh, victim of gender-based violence? Because as Lousy said, we need to move out of those fair where the real action are not there, where the budget is voted, but not implemented the grassroots for the people. So give a face to the victim, give the sense that it's you, your sister, your mother, your, your child, and then the network can change. If we don't manage to really give a face to that and personalize, it's always going to remain out of us, even when we are the victims. So this should change. And what I'm talking about the network, women, give a hand, stop believe you are alone. Even in a country like my country, 61% of women in parliament, we have really strong gender-based violence pro program. During a COVID, we didn't so an increase because we have created a resilient health system, uh, sorry, system for protection. We need a resilient health system for protection that, uh, that prevent any shock. More than the health sector, we need prevention uh, to, to, to make it happen, not to come after the problem. Um, and also never believe that it's it's our right. It's not a gift that you give to us and we should fight. Take a lesson of the activism that brought IOVs in Africa. Take a lesson of the, the, the connection and the coordination Africa have done for responding to COVID. Take a lesson of all the great things that are out there already responding locally that we can generalize. Let's be without any limits. It's time. 
So, um, Professor Agnes, you were supposed to close off as well, and I feel like you've given us a closing and you still will, but I do want to pick on a couple of seconds among all of the panelists, because I think we're sitting here with the resource of the continent. Um, moving to Dr. Olive, you're based at the World Health Organization, and I understand that there, there are mechanisms or there are plans in place to put in a, a youth council. Within a network, a plan network such as this one, which is really at the incubation stage, what will be the mechanisms or possible mechanisms for, for youth inclusion? Uh, Professor Agnes spoke a little bit about including adolescent girls and young women. Yeah, thank you very much, Shakira. And I think that's uh, right from the beginning. I did mention the need for those girls and women's voices to be heard. But along in there, what are the voices, if any, and what should we be doing with the actual cause? And I think um, Francelina has mentioned that we really need to look back at what are the underlying causes which we are not addressing. We, uh, as a country, have had this very high uh, girls, adolescent pregnancy and early marriage and all those related issues. But there is a thinking now that we need to address the norm, what we considered as the norm in Uganda of promiscuity of young girls getting married, of marrying off these adolescent girls and people think this is part of the cultural religious norm. So beginning to question what may have been the actual cause is going to be a real direction going forward and therefore working with where we actually believe that that is where the problem is being manufactured. It's very important to work with the girls, hearing the girls' voices and the women's voices. But they stop somewhere when we do not bring in the voices of these men, the voices of the cultural institutions, the voices of the religious institutions, which could be having some practices and beliefs that actually potentiate what we are dealing with. Dr. Olive, and, I'm going to I'm going to have to cut you off from a time perspective, but I think that you've you've raised important issues. I want to thank each of the panelists. Um, you brought to the fore one the priorities from teenage pregnancy to unemployment to the need for investment that we need to think about. Three, how will this network be set up? Which constituents will be engaged? Which constituents will set the priorities? And I then pass over to, um, to Professor Agnes to close us off. I also want to flag that there are questions in the chat. Please, panelists, if you would like to answer them, do go ahead. They're around the COVID-19 patents and also an important issue for the possible network. With that, we, we close off hashtag GHH Forum 2021. So thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, dear panelists and participants, uh, it was a great honor for me to be part of this panel on a problem that is too old and we have, the world has no excuse to not have tackled more uh, uh, strongly. So we, uh, uh, this pandemic has exposed a lot of gap on our gender empowerment and uh, on our gender protection uh, strategy. So because we don't know when this pandemic will be behind us, and also because we know that there are already other threats that are there impacting the life of the majority of people in our continent, especially the women, like climate change and um, access to energy, access to education. And also because every three months of lockdown, we expect 15 million new cases of, of uh, gender-based violence. We need to take lesson of what I was exchanged today and also yesterday uh, in this forum because it is time. 
we can take lesson, as we have said, from the activists of the eighth time. We can take lesson of the great coordination, innovation, and uh, forward thinking uh, of uh, how Africa have tackled this pandemic. We can also take lessons on how uh, people have behaved with trust and discipline. Why do, and are we not doing that? We also can see how Africa have created rapidly new institution to strengthen her response to COVID. How are we not doing that to strengthen our response to gender-based violence? Because as we have said, it has to be proactive. We need prevention and we need rapid action for, um, uh, for, for protection. And the discussion has just started. And I would like to express my gratitude to organize, the organizer of uh, uh, this uh, uh, annual forum of uh, UNU uh, Gender and Health Hub. And just tell everybody that the discussion is ongoing. Join other events that will be there to continue this discussion, it's just a start. We need to come out with something strong, some, something that will change. It we cannot, Africa should be on the front front of that because it's not in our culture to mistreat our women. Let's go back to our ancestral value. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thank Agnes. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join the next session, which starts in 30 minutes, just under 30 minutes. So we look forward to seeing you then.